All right, uh, well, we have returned to open session. Uh, so at this time, is there any public comment? There is not. Okay, uh, then at this time, are there any uh, board member changes to the agenda? All right, then that will take us to committee reports. Uh, first committee up is facilities. Thank you, Dan. Uh, as you know, today is actually going to be a lot of presentation about our proposed potential plans. Uh, the big items that we have going right now are potential improvements at Hollywood, which includes the multi-purpose room as well as the playground, uh, central, Hauser play parking separation, um, Blythe Park parking lot, Hauser Auditorium. Have I hit most of them, Martha? I think so. Uh, these are all potential items that we can improve and need to make some choices about moving forward. So, so in some ways, we're taking the work from the Facilities Advisory Committee and bringing it to the full board just for more discussion. We wanted to make sure we set a context, we give opportunity for the board to discuss a sense of priorities. I know we've talked uh, some about the Hollywood multi-purpose room and the Hollywood playground. Um, we probably have not talked a lot as a board about the Central Hauser campus. Um, and we have Kevin Clark from Lakota Group who's going to give us just a kind of a brief introduction. We said maybe about 10 minutes um, to kind of give you an overview of the project ideas. These are very conceptual at this point, but wanting the board to understand uh, where this goes potentially. I don't, Linda, you look like maybe you're going to add some other comments? No. Okay. I was not. Okay. <laughs> All right. Warming up. <laughs> All right. Um, so, so Kevin, I know Kevin is on Zoom participating with us, and he also has some presentation materials. You have them in your board book as um, Master Plan 3 and Master Plan Phasing. Uh, so one of the things we've talked about um, is, is just, this, as perhaps everyone has imagined, this is a complicated idea. Um, around how to improve the outdoor play space, how to better separate play and parking. Um, and we know that this parking lot was redone five years ago also. So again, just wanting to study this and understand it. So we, um, as you know, several couple of years ago already and um, intentionally hired Lakota Group and Gowalt uh, Hamilton Engineering to take a look, kind of take a specialized look at this space. And um, they have chatted with our principals and our PE teachers and certainly with the committee, but I don't know if Dora, Linda, you want to give it any more of an introduction than that? Um, Lakota and Gowalt Hamilton looked at both parking and circulation on the exterior of the site, and that ends up being more of a, a limited impact in terms of cost, and then they also presented, and Kevin can correct, correct me where I'm wrong here, three different uh, conceptual site plans which were very different in terms of how they used the back lot. And when I say the back lot, I mean the parking lot and the, the grassy area and the area behind Central that's kind of a little cubby hole. And uh, I think, Kevin, you can go into more detail. So Kevin, we'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, good introduction. I'll share my screen so everyone can see what I'm talking about. Um, and I, I um, just created a, a brief presentation. Um, let's see if I can get on here. Are we in trouble? Even though we've been on Zoom for like a year now, uh, mm -hmm. somehow I'm always missing my window. <clears throat> let's see. Uh, let's see. I can't wait for Zoom to like not dominate my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. All right. And I'm going to do a cube, um, a full screen version here. Um, and I promise I'll be brief. Uh, Martha told me I have 10 minutes and I'm good at talking fast. So hopefully I don't talk too fast. Um, this isn't the ideal way for me to present anything. Trust me. I'm uh, much better in person, but I'll try to go through this. Um, and I just wanted to start back really quick about just reminding everybody what pro the process was um, and all the steps included. And I just included some bullet points here. Um, we started this out 
Um, working with the facility advisory committee, we created a project brand. We did analysis of the site, um, looking at um, everything that was happening, physical conditions, understanding, um, you know, it was out there uh, from a landscape standpoint, from a stormwater standpoint, hardscape, all those things that make up the function of the campus. We did a traffic analysis, um, really um, where Gay Walt Hamilton got out on site and, and observed uh, parking and student drop off and pick up. All of this was um, included in a, in a state of the campus report. And we also talked to a bunch of people over the course of a day or two. Um, that included administration, faculty and staff, maintenance staff, um, uh, student groups, which was amazing, um, and parents. Um, we wanted to just understand all the issues because as Martha mentioned, it's not cut and dry. It's a kind of a complex issue, um, uh, trying to uh, improve the campus itself and the functionality and all the things that people want. Um, other things that we did, committee reviews. Uh, I met with the village and presented to them, including police, fire, village planners, uh, the village uh, admin, uh, uh, manager. Um, and then we developed some concepts, uh, multiple concepts which you had in your packet, and I'll go through briefly. Um, Ramesh helped us pull together order of magnitude cost. That was ultimately what we were trying to get to was what does it cost to make improvements to the campus? And, and, and um, then from that kind of refinement of this preferred concept, which I'll, which I'll go through. Um, Summary of the key theme, things, just a reminder of what we're trying to do, pick up and drop off areas. We know that we needed to address that. Um, these things aren't mutually exclusive. So um, we change one thing, most of them affect something else. So it was about organizing the campus, trying to get parking, access and delivery um, uh, organized um, um, and, and bringing uh, student areas, people spaces, his spaces um, into a safe place. Um, and that, that included playground, blacktop and, and play areas, um, as well as the recreation field, which we heard about from every group we talked to um, about how it doesn't really work. And is there a way that we can get something that works and works for more of the student population for both schools? Um, and then also, you know, the front of the school along Woodside and thinking about how we can improve that overall from a pickup and drop off standpoint um, as well as in the back. So what we did is, uh, you know, we did, I'm just gonna skim through these kind of three concepts high level um, and then come back to the preferred concept and talk about where we ended up once we were um, engaging Ramesh into the, the um, budget discussion. But the first concept kind of thought about, well, how do we reorganize parking and, and all of them really do this, but where do we reorganize parking to get a better play space and get vehicles um, away from the school? I mean, that was by and large what we were trying to do. And in this one, we really envisioned that you have asphalt here now. Is there a way that we can get all the parking back into one space that you have on campus and then get a play field, whether it's turf or synthetic turf, um, into a location that's um, bigger, better, um, you know, we talked a lot about synthetic turf because it can be used right after rain. It can be used um, repeatedly. Uh, right now, the, the sod that's out there gets, gets trampled and muddy and it's <laughs> usable a lot of the time. Um, the other part was getting a play space or a playground in the back for older kids. We have one in the front now. Is there a way to get something that was more um, inclusive of everybody? And then also just outdoor classroom spaces, which you see with kind of E and F. And you'll notice the one thing we did with this was we eliminated kind of that that vehicular cut through that goes through here, um, all the way from inside the wood site. Um, so the the way that this works is um, pick up and drop off on, in the back is actually extended into the site so that kids get dropped off. The younger kids can get dropped off closer to an, an entry without having to cross the parking lot, without having to fend off where maybe vehicles are driving. Um, and that was kind of the big idea here, but using a lot of the infrastructure you had. The second concept um, thought a little differently um, and still pulled all of the, the um, space for kids and people adjacent to the building. You'll notice there's no cut through 
here with vehicles, we actually created a new curb cut that came through from Aikenside to Woodside that could be a drop off, um, releasing cars in this direction, and also a one way system where parking would be on both sides of, of a single drive aisle, allowing drop off to happen here with, with pathways that get into the building on sidewalks. So again, um, students getting dropped off, they're on a sidewalk, they're entering the building without having to cross uh, uh, the parking lot, and all the parking is on the perimeter of the site in this concept. We kind of show two lawn areas, whether it's synthetic or, or natural, um, as these G elements, more of a rectangular shape, another space maybe for the younger kids, um, and a playground for, you know, 5 to 12, um, age range in the back, uh, and just implying that there's landscape. Again, these are conceptual designs that would be, need to be taken to the next level, but the idea that kids don't necessarily have to play in the asphalt anymore, there are spaces for that to happen, um, and there's a bigger, larger space for flexible outdoor play to occur. The third concept built upon that a little bit more and created even a larger lawn space for more flexibility, um, again, including a, a, a playground in the back, maybe, you know, this one um, showed maybe some outdoor uh, classroom spaces, um, gathering spaces uh, adjacent to Hauser in this location, which also serves as a buffer from the play area to the building. And again, this one kind of functions in the same way um, with pickup drop-off and allowing cars to pull in, um, park, or drop off for kids to come to the building along safe um, sidewalks and pathways uh, and just using the rest of the space for parking. So where we arrived at the preferred plan was concept A, and this was a lot of discussion. We, went, we probably had multiple meetings just talking about this. Um, the concept A um, was the preferred plan ultimately because it kind of works with the existing infrastructure as a starting point, kind of reusing that asphalt parking lot, maybe restriping it to begin with, um, and, and uh, not necessarily having to just redo all infrastructure uh, at the same time. And I'll show you about um, how the phasing could work in the next slide. Um, it meets the goals of separating student space from vehicles. I think to me this was the biggest thing and the most um, striking thing being on campus, how the vehicular space kind of dominated. It was spread out all over the back, um, and there was there was a lot of conflict between um, pedestrians, both kids and adults, uh, kids on bikes and vehicles, um, trying to really clear that up and clean it up. Um, it adds in flexible play space, a playground, and outdoor learning environment and garden spaces in the back. Um, these are all the things that we were we were tasked to do and we found a way to um, accommodate that by um, putting the parking in one location in a bigger pod. Um, we enhance pickup and drop off, particularly in the rear of the building. The thing I like about it the most is we are pulling cars off of Aiken side onto campus in an orderly way and then getting kids as close as possible to the back of the school to, to, um, to enter into the building or exit the building. Um, and that's the, that was one of the things that we really wanted to, to work and um, as we showed, you know, the village and, and all of, um, the people there, they, they appreciated that as, as a way of, of getting cars off of Aiken side that may be back up now onto Aiken side. Um, we eliminated the vehicular cut through from Aiken side to Woodside, which apparently has been there for a really long time and people do it. Um, it's not a direct connection, but it is a connection and almost like a sneaky way for people to, to get around the village. Um, and, and to me, that, that was a, a goal to eliminate um, or control in some way. And then, you know, lastly, it wasn't, you know, I just started running numbers and running measures, looking at numbers. It wasn't as costly as other concepts, both short and long term, because we're trying to build upon a little bit of what's existing. And so just to revisit, you know, what that concept was, um, building upon that existing asphalt, um, trying to, you know, basically extend that existing um, lawn area and potentially with the synthetic lawn and just making it bigger um, and then adding the play space here. But all of this would be, you know, this color is sidewalk space, um, very organized, 
allowing kids to walk their bikes or walk from the neighborhood to campus, creating those extra spaces that may be outdoor learning environments or outdoor classroom spaces, trying to utilize some of the back end spaces that could be colorful or better or student art exhibits, all those things um, just maximizing what we can get out of a really tight campus and, and um, trying to make it value added to the kids and for the education. Um, and so last slide here, um, you know, Ramesh and I started breaking down, well, how can you do this in kind of a phased approach, knowing that the, the grandiose, you know, overall over, um, maximum approach to rebuild everything is a big number. Is there a way that we can start with kind of the minimal approach, which is consolidating the parking, doing some restriping for pickup drop off in the back, um, you know, maybe getting that, that turf field built and, and a little bit of a, a circulation around that with um, walkways, um, maybe in the short term, we're, we're disallowing any movement for vehicles here. Um, and then, uh, and to us, the pros to that, we're eliminating the conflict consolidating those play areas into one space um, and better drop off close to the building in the back and more stacking for vehicles back here, which I mentioned. The, the kind of challenges or cons that we saw is that scheduling and division of play space still needs to be addressed. It would just need to be addressed. And we talked about that um, with April and Pete and how we can, we can really use this space um, and divide it out for the kids. Um, the, the Central and Hazard kids and make sure that everybody has a space because we're really not, the blacktop would be used as a parking lot now, what is considered the blacktop. Um, and, you know, another con is that this really is unimproved in the short term, it's just asphalt, um, and there aren't really those, those additive outdoor spaces. Um, as we get into the mid approach, we start to add some of those things, um, the, you know, the, the extra playground. Um, the outdoor learning environments and the extra outdoor classrooms here, um, maybe a little bit more of the landscape and some of these other spaces can be addressed in the rear. And then as we get to kind of the full build approach and that's when we start to add in those other elements, trying to clean up the, the pickup drop off in the front on, on wood side, adding in the landscape and the outdoor classrooms um, at the side of how they're uh, and so, and, and then improving the, the kind of playground and the extra space on the front by, by Central. I know that was a lot. Um, I guess I, I don't know if uh, Ramesh, if you're going to dive in there or Martha, um, but I appreciate everybody's time to let me explain that. And before we say goodbye, does anybody have questions specifically for Kevin Clark from the Lakota Group? I, I had one question. I, I think I heard the answer, but I, I want to make sure. Did, was it said that that no parking is lost for any of these plans? In, in concept A, we um, we actually had a couple spaces. Um, we are pushing it a little bit. Um, any concept, I should say, when we go to um, the village, we will have to ask for some concessions. Um, you know, if we need to add a couple landscape islands, um, I think we would come out whole. The goal was always to come out whole. The other two concepts were within a few spaces of what you have now and I think could be addressed as we, if they move forward that could be addressed and we could find how we can get we could just be equal. Hi I have a question at Terry Kleiber. Um, for concept A is the playground labeled H in the back designed for both like kindergartners and first graders and all the way up to fifth or is it is it a is it a blend or is it just one age group? I wasn't sure about that. I, you know, I think it could accommodate, um, usually they make playgrounds um, for younger kids, it's usually kind of the two to five and then five to 12, which I know seems like a weird way to do it. I think um, we would have space, I think, to have some uh, stuff for the younger kids. Um, I think, you know, as we talked about it with the facility advisory committee, um, we would still want to address the playground in the front in the long term. Um, it just, you know, most people didn't feel real safe about it. There are a lot of stones around it. Um, I, so I think we could find a little bit back here, but ultimately we would want to, re I think you really want to redo both. Okay, thank you. So Kevin, this, well, is, this is Jeff Miller. I don't know if you can hear me. I'm not sure how good the microphone is here. 
I have it on. Yeah. Yeah. Can, uh, Kevin, this is Jeff Miller. Can you hear me? Um, a little bit. A little bit. Maybe lean closer to the mic. Okay, yeah. Can you hear me now? No, 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 no. Yeah, so yeah. tripod there. Oh, yeah. where's the tripod? Yeah. Stay yeah. <laughs> here. Okay. Can, can you hear me now? Um, yeah, that's better. Yeah. Hi, Tech. Um, yeah. So I, 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 um, I like, I like Plan A. I'm glad you guys uh, are recommending that. Um, I think that uh, getting rid of that through uh, that through passage um, on the north side is uh, is actually quite good. I think. Uh, I'd be a little bit skeptical of having actually that put in there. Um, um, well, I guess my one of my questions is: Have you considered um, alternatives to artificial turf? I know that artificial turf has a finite lifetime and it's quite expensive. Um, have you thought about um, alternatives to that? You know, like a natural grass. Um, maybe we have to put some, uh, you know, drainage. Uh, in there in a sand layer or something like that, but have you, have you considered that that possibility? Yeah, I mean, I, there was so, we've had so much discussion about this, and I appreciate the question. Um, you know, and Ramesh can dive in there too. I think, you know, you could do it with drainage layers. You could make this, you could try to make that the best natural turf that's out there, right? Um, it won't always, it won't solve the entire issue, um, meaning um, there will still be times where it's really inundated and you can't use it. That's the value of the, the synthetic turf, and I know there's there's a lot of discussion about synthetic turf, but that's why people use it. Um, you know, you can basically use it 24-7. You can use it right after it rains. Um, and, and, you know, we've talked about it, and it, I mean, there's it's, it's a maintenance thing. It's a long-term um, cost thing, I understand. Um, and that'll be something that will need to be weighed. Uh, I don't remember the cost differential for mesh. Um, yeah, I can draw, I can jump yeah. into that. So, so uh, Jeff, to answer your question, yes, you could go in with a natural grass uh, instead of artificial turf. But oddly enough, the drainage cost for natural uh, grass is much higher because you have to run off a lot more water in a very defined manner. So that's number one. That's the first part of it that makes it more expensive. Second thing is maintenance is very high because as Kevin mentioned, if uh, there's water, standing water of any kind of, of any nature, it will start to destroy the grass if it's played on. So the big advantage of artificial turf is longevity actually off the surface and it's an all season uh, year round um, place surface as compared to natural turf. And the cost differential really is, um, you really have to look at it from a long-term perspective. The, the uh, natural grass would actually have to be replaced multiple times as compared to artificial turf, which has a lifespan of anywhere from 10 to 15 years at a minimum. And if it's maintained correctly, it can even last longer than that, especially the newer turfs are much, much more friendlier to uh, athletics as compared to what you had uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Thanks, Ramesh. Uh, just one more question on this uh, area labeled H, which is the playground uh, proper. Um, do you know the approximate square footage of that and, uh, and how it compares, uh, for example, to the Ames playground? Yes, it's 7,400 square feet. And how big yeah, is how it? How compared to the Ames playground? Yes. It's, uh, as you can see, the shape is like, it's, it's a longer, it's not as square as the Ames one. It's smaller. Considerably smaller, it would seem like. It's Ames, yes, yes, significantly smaller. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that, just to add on that, um, in the beginning, I'm sure Joel will remember in the facility committee, like plan A for me was my least favorite in the beginning, simply because of that, because the playground is smaller and um, that one area of grass is where we put the NPE for essential and housing to happen. So if you notice in the, the second two plans, there's an additional grass space, there's an additional area for central. So with this this plan, I was always very concerned that it's improving Hauser, but is it really improving central too much? But then I know that um, 
everybody met with Pete in April and they really determined they could make it a schedule where that grass area would be accessible for a recess. So that would have to be somehow codified so that they didn't come back in two years and say, oh, well, no, that was just Right, right. So that, my big concern with Plan A originally was, is it really improving the central right. outdoor recess? Where it's a smaller spot, they're all there, but with scheduling, they, they believe it, it can happen. Um, and, I mean, quite honestly, that I mean, preserving the current asphalt is so much cheaper. So plan, you know, that was my only reservation with plan A and, and Pete and April saying they could accommodate. So as long as they can accommodate, I felt a little bit com more comfortable with it, but I just wanted to kind of throw it out there that we did kind of, you know, think about that. It would have to, the answer would come through scheduling. It's not mm -hmm. perfect by any means, but again, I think we were trying to and I think this gets at the complexity of this whole thing. We were trying to balance all these things. You know, obviously putting students at the center of what would really improve play, improve safety, address that you know vehicular con conflict that everyone has, has commented on. Um, it it becomes the more preferred one because of cost by a significant degree. Okay. I guess are we all um, board, uh, sort of? Uh, I think uh, Kevin mentioned there's like there could be different phases, but. Would we all agree that we couldn't sort of, we, we sort of have to do a playground for Central? We can't sort of say that, oh, that's going to come off in, in five years, right? We can't, we can't do that. Is that, is that, no. is that's my sentiment, Audie? I mean, I, is that what you agree with? I mean, that? No, that's also I, something I mentioned. Yeah. You mean an existing location? No, I'm just saying that we, um, we can't build playgrounds everywhere else and then say to Central, well, we'll yeah. you'll get that down the road. So right. we'll, no, we'll, actually. We an approach. I know we, we did talk about it in the committee. Right. We mentioned that. And we mentioned that we did, we are able to put that playground in at that point. It's just obviously phase one will be much more, you know, more expensive than, than like, you know, mm -hmm. spacing the cost out over the years. But yeah, those, I mean, those are, Ramesh, I'm sure you, you have anything to add yeah. or if you have anything to add, that is a possibility though. Mm -hmm. We can, we can decide Absolutely. what the important features are to phase in. Okay. I mean, obviously it makes sense to do it in a certain way for cost effectiveness, but, well, but I would agree. I personally agree with that. The deterioration of the current playground in its form is maybe some impetus to go ahead with that as well because the other one is just destroyed. So. Yeah, Ramesh can comment on that too, but they, the, nothing like they basically had to take that old central playground out because of all the exterior work that's happening. Yeah. They're putting it back in. I know I said to Ramesh, is it worth even putting back in because the equipment is old? Um, but I, I agree, there seems to be some sense of priority or urgency around mm -hmm. a, a playground for central students. Um, we had talked about, and I know we're going to talk about all of this sort of in a comprehensive way as we do the, we talk about all these projects together, that perhaps this project would be a summer of 2022 project, um, even if we were to move forward, just given the complexities of things that are still unresolved, but wanting to get a sense from the board of, of the, the flavor, the preferences. I think, Linda, you said it well, does, does A solve our problems enough? You know, um, it, it doesn't solve them as well as some of the other plans, but it certainly addresses the financial piece. Right, it's much more cost effective, yeah. which is yeah. obviously all right. So that on that on that on that topic of cost effectiveness, uh, Ramesh, you said, um, I don't know, Kevin maybe talked about phases. I assume yeah. when you talk about I'm phases, that, the last slide again. yeah, you're 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 talking about phases. Just just not you're not saying the total cost would be lower if we do it in phases. It's just that it would the sticker shock wouldn't be as high. It's like you you sort of, it would seem like it's lower because you're kind of bleeding it out over time as opposed to just paying up front. But presumably the cost would be equally high, if not higher by doing it in phases than if you just did it all at once. Is that true? That is absolutely correct. Uh, a phase approach is definitely more expensive because you have multiple mobilizations, multiple bids, the whole process is extended. But on the other hand, it gave us an opportunity to actually do something at an early stage. I mean, try and address the biggest issue of trying to get an all season playground in uh, at Central Houser. So rather than, um, have sticker shock at 10 and 11 million, we could start the project at uh, around 3 million to do the minimum approach, which was to put in the all season playground and restripe the parking lot. We would not rebuild it at this stage. We would just restripe it so that it, um, we have the number of parking spaces as um, Kevin has indicated out there. That would be the start starting project. But if you go from the minimum approach all the way to the maximum approach, the project starts to balloon into the eight and a half, ten million dollar range. Uh, 
there are lots of issues that have to be addressed um, going forward. But to just to get the project going, we thought that uh, we would look at the minimum approach as part of a master plan that can be approved by the board for an FY22 project. So, well, and to this point is you can build it in stages and each stage is usable. So if we choose as a board that there are other appropriate ways to spend our resources or there's some other priority, we can hold off for two years. Nothing about the first phase is deficient or unusable or somehow detracts from its utility. No, I get that. It just it sort of reminds me of like remodeling your house. Like if you're thinking like I'm gonna remodel this bathroom, should I wait ten years or should I do it now? You know, yeah. while well, you're gonna be living there, you might as well do it now if you're gonna do it anyway, right? So you might as well get the advantage if you're gonna have to do it eventually. Not have to, but if you think yeah. you're going to. So it just sort of does like it's sort of illusory to sort of say we're gonna do it in phases to save money. You're not saving money. You're just like yeah, except for you know the just the cost of it. Like, do we have eight million to pay for it? Then yeah, like that's it's that's some right. Like that's, no. that's the other. I, I, I guess. Well, and I, I appreciate the, 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 the this plan, plan. I guess doing it in a phase. What 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 is the cost differential? Saying like we do it all in 2022 or versus all in 2022 through 20, 2026. I mean, 2025. Um, so, uh, if you break up the projects, the minimum approach, as I said, is between two and a half and three million. The maximum approach is, again, I'm giving you, if you were to do the maximum approach in a single year, we're looking at an eight and a half to nine million dollar project. But if you break it out into three phases, you start to develop it from phase one to phase two to phase three, the project would balloon by about 50 to 20 percent at the very least, not including installation. Because of loss of efficiency? Loss of efficiency, the fact that you would have to have submit three separate designs to the village. I mean, it's just a more bureaucratic approach from the standpoint that you need three approvals each time. Designs have to be done as separate standalone projects. You have to bid it out three different times. and. Uh, you're just not getting the efficiency of a master plan. You're getting the efficiency of a single project, which is part of the master plan. But if our budget only allows for that, that would be the approach to go by because you adopt a master plan and execute parts of it as money become available as compared to going all the way and spending the eight and a half, nine million dollars on in FI22. So just, just for curiosity's sake, we've said Minimum and maximum approach price tags a couple times. What what is the mid approach? The mid approach means you're doing the selected projects that you see that can. No, no, I mean price the tag. The, so the price range I think we heard you know two and a half to three million for the first, eight and a half to nine million yeah. for maximum. What's the range for the uh, mid approach? It's about uh, close to seven. It's five and a half to five and a half to seven million. The reason why the uh, discrepancy of that is so high is because uh, in uh, the mid approach we're actually going to be rebuilding um, the, uh, the parking lot. We're not just restriping it. We actually have to go back in and rebuild it. Why? Oh, yeah, why is that? Why? Um, part of the reason behind that is now you would have to start addressing a lot of drainage issues that come along and then you're looking at area B which has to be built out so there are number of things that will start to come into play which will start to affect the runoff that you have to address uh, once the project starts to increase in size. Because the current uh, project right now is a stand, I mean the parking lot addresses the drainage just for itself but once you have a master plan you would have to address a lot of drainage issues stemming from the overall master plan itself and the area D that comes into play, area E will come into play, all those areas would have to be addressed. For me, my opinion is that uh, the playground section D would be a mandatory or a minimum approach. Um, I know I've said that at the facility advisory committee as well, that I, I can't imagine not including the playground in the first, in the first so there's no way we can do that. I mean, just no way out of yeah, just I mean, equity. I definitely yeah. think there's ways not to appro uh, approach section E and, and possibly, you know, the E on the central and the, the E on the Hauser campus. Like those are 
those would be really nice to have, but they're, to me, they're not right. need to have immediately. But for me, personally, I don't know how everybody else feels, I think the playground has to be a part of the first wave. Yeah, I think this is the only school where children do not have a playground. If they are above kindergarten or first grade, they do not play on equipment ever. Mm -hmm. They never have for years and years. And right. And I'm going to that is the issue. I'm push back on that with everybody. And our goal is to provide education. The playground is nice to have, but it's not essential. Well, so that, that's I, true. I heartily disagree with this idea that every school has to be the same. They're all different. Hollywood has its issues. Blythe has its issues. I, I'm concerned I, I, that all of a sudden this blows up into a nine or ten million dollar project because we have to do it and we don't. We, well, we well, get to make a choice. We can't, we, we can't, we can't go out and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on Hollywood and we just spend I don't know how much on Ames. No, say, actually oh, we well, can. Well, we can do that, but, uh, but the, one of the primary goals of this whole project was equity between the schools and we can't say Central, you're still on the plate, you're still on the parking lot or whatever, you're still on the grassy area. You don't, you don't have any struggle. I mean, that would be crazy to say Which that. Is, think about it, if we do the minimum approach, the blacktop is a parking lot. So their current play area is no longer So we leave that. There. So I don't understand why just adding age to the whole story will change yeah. the drainage picture at all. I mean, honestly, there's already drainage there for the oh, parking lot. So I don't see why that would add $5 million to the plan. Well, Personally, I think the playground is, is, is an educational issue. Those children are sitting all day. They need to move and play. It's minimum, even if it's 20 minutes, it's important to their day. I, I know Mark has seen about that. I mean, I'm a teacher. It's important. It's just not even just a nice to have. That is important to them to have a well, I guess my thing, and I think we're sort of like, I'm not debating the plan. I don't want to debate the plan. I sort of want to debate the, more of the approach because I think we should, I think the plan is good. I think we should just uh, decide to go either go for it. I'm more concerned about, I think we should just do this all at once um, because doing a phased approach, first of all, like having it cost 15 to 20% more, I mean, that, that's a significant amount of money. Um, and who's to say that then down the road we don't have it or other priorities, um, other boards? I, I, I do think we should seriously look at not doing it as a phase approach and just doing it all at once. Certain. Well, in that in that in that vein, I guess I, I I'm very curious to know why there is such a big cost difference between the the first phase and the second and third because. I agree that, you know, Ramesh says we're doing everything again, that we're doing the parking lot again, but why can't we just leave the parking lot as it is, as it would be in the first phase, put that uh, er other area in G in there, all we'd be adding is H and then some grass and trees on, on areas E and F and leave D as it is. But, you know, but, that would seem like it would be done, basically. Right, but, but, but it's, I mean, Ramesh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I mean, it, it sounds like it's all having to do with drainage issues. I mean. And I, I mean, I'm not a, a water person, but I mean, I know just from like doing rehab work myself, once you open up the walls, and as we know from here, when we open up, yeah. once you start opening walls or digging into the ground, you don't know what you're gonna find. Well, no, I agree with that, but so, I'm saying if, if, we're yeah. do, if G and B are part of phase one, and those are the major areas, surface areas, and the drainage is okay for that, then I don't see how adding H and E are, are gonna change that sub substantially. I mean, maybe it will, I'd like to see that, but I, don't, I just don't see that. And that's a question I guess I have for the committee. It's like, yeah. come back and prove that we have to totally redo the, the drainage just by adding H or E or whatever. Because it seems, to me, I don't understand why that would be true. Yeah, I think we also need to One thing that I want to point out is that when the project was done a few years ago, uh, I'm talking about the parking lot was repaid. Uh, the designers had actually created a permeable parking lot, but when it was bid and the costs were received, they were found to be very excessive. And at that time, it was chosen to just to go ahead and repave the parking, to rebuild it as is with no permeable surfaces. If you do a project like this with a master plan, there is simply no way that we could get away with not doing uh, permeable surfaces. Um, because the drainage requirements and surface runoff would be so great that the village will force us, like what happened at Ames, where we entered the project with hard surfaces, but by the time we got the permit, we were required to put in permeable surfaces. The same thing will happen in this project too. The only advantage of the minimum approach is we have the large 
playground, the artificial turf ground, which is going to have a huge underground drainage system, which will allow us to do runoff in there. And we would just say that we are restriping the parking lot A in the minimum approach. Once you start going into the mid approach, the maximum approach, then the scope of work has started to grow substantially. And we would need to start to think about permeable surfaces and how we can control the runoff and what the village would, would uh, accept. That's the reason why we feel that that parking lot would have to be rebuilt. And after seeing what happened at Central in the front of the building, this project that we started in September, which started off as a $10,000 project, improved 300,000 and keeps growing because of all the stuff that we found in there, nothing that was designed previously met the current code and the village and MWRD has made us rebuild pretty much all the storm and sanitary lines in front of the building. And just from that process, we just don't know what we're going to find at the back of the, in the same, uh, in the same overall master plan that we would have to execute. So I just want to be very clear about this, that we'd be very careful as to how we can develop the cost and not have a huge sudden change order which is worth a couple of million bucks and the board will say how do we how do we not foresee that so it's best to include that number now let it get designed let's get the feedback from the village at which point a decision could be made whether we want to execute the mid approach or the max approach but at least that way we can get started with the minimum So what, you know, one of our goals tonight was to make sure that we that you had this as sort of an idea, a concept, and context as we look at all the other things that we've been talking about. So maybe what would make sense is for Jim and I to kind of jump in next because Jim, as you know from the you know the packet that you've um, you know had a chance to preview, um, has a lot of the financial information about just sort of the overall district position financially. So I think what you know this is really helpful we've gotten some really valuable feedback we knew that we weren't making any decisions tonight um, but I think you know again really valuable feedback to take back to committee to bring back to the board to continue the conversation and then we can look at the financial picture related to the other projects and kind of yeah. get everything globally which yeah, I know is our I just want to say it's also worth noting the plan can also be altered so we, it's not like we have this plan a and like if we don't actually want to put in a an outdoor learning where the old driveway was like that doesn't have to be a part of the plan you know so this is i don't feel like we it's modifiable we, want to, you know, we are so early on in this conversation that we can modify if we do decide to go and do the whole plan at once we can modify you know that we don't have to commit to every element on this plan yes in my, in my Exactly. Right. Right. We would dip below forty percent. And forty percent is eleven million dollars. I mean that right, right, right. Yeah, these are exactly the complexities of it all. So are people comfortable moving on? And because I think that gives you a chance to revisit, you know, now the financial questions yeah. more. Or do you want to spend more time with Lakota and with Ramesh? I'm comfortable. I would say that I again I, I come back to this long-range facilities plan and uh, the architect came up with that uh, over a course of time and this is not nothing to the committee but they did put estimates on there for all of these different things and once again the estimate they put on here is wildly different than what we're actually hearing now it's not like off by 10 percent or 20 percent it's off by like a factor of three or four or five <laughs> it's like so it's like what do you that that plan is like in, in my view, practically useless from a monetary point of view. It tells us nothing, because every single thing we've done has been way more expensive. You're talking about the plan that was five years ago. Three years ago. Was, was February of 2018 was when DLA gave us their uh, long-range facility plan. And all of those pieces in that long-range facility plan have cost estimates. We're going to do the Blythe, we're going to do this, that. And this, the cost estimate for this project was $1.4 in that document. Which again is like the low the low cost here is two and a half times that the high cost is like six times that so like it's once again in that document is is like it just it's so disappointing to me that they're well I, wildly I, off you know? I, I, I guess to, Jeff to your point I, I can appreciate this and I mean I've de dealt with this type of stuff before I mean they're they're giving you estimates on what 
you want. It's like building a house. You can say, let's build a house, it's gonna cost you $100 a square foot, but then if you want like marble, like a marble foyer and like uh, uh, special tile and all this, it can add up to like $300 a square foot. And so I think there, we, we probably should do a better job when we do this going forward of saying, okay, we want like sort of giving them a little bit more parameters to give us mm -hmm. estimates because my guess is that $1.4 million is maybe just I, I don't know what it is, but I'm just sort of throwing that out there. Maybe just oh. putting grass down and restriping the parking lot. I, so I, or giving them the design of it. And I'd have to go back and read the fine print. I do know DLA from the beginning said you would need to look at this as a separate project. This I would hire, encourage you to hire, you know, uh, traffic engineer and landscape architect, which is exactly what we did, right? I mean, they gave us direction to kind of parcel this project out as something pretty separate and unique, but. I, I would guess as well, I think I heard drainage about 50 times that the, the increased, uh, the, our experience, our past experience with Ames and with Central to a certain degree has better informed the latest designs. And Ramesh's hesitation because it's, he knows, we know that we will get in front of the village or water reclamation district and they will have their say and we don't have a lot of maneuvering room with regards to fulfilling their requirements. Mm -hmm. Those end up being drop dead requirements, do not pass go. So we end up being obligated to spend that money when they get their say. Well, I think it's, I think it's good to then move into the financial conversation like Martha was saying, because then a lot of the, the what you guys have shared tonight has been super helpful for for me as a facilities committee member because um, I, I never thought I would hear like well I think we should do more like I I, I think maybe we weren't it's been great to hear this perspective you know what I'm saying but once we have this financial conversation and then we think about how much do we have and then then we can come back to this plan A and think how can we adjust this to maybe be something more realistic to uh, the you know. A budget. I mean, we want we want to do something. We, you know, we probably can't go over. You know, <laughs> so I think it'll be helpful to have that financial conversation to see where we're at and what we're comfortable spending, and that would inform the approach probably. Yeah, we're comfortable moving forward with that. With sort of the next part. So um, Jim Jim is out in the hall. I assume Jim's going to come in. So Don will switch presentations and say goodbye to Kevin. And I think Ramesh is still going to uh, stand by if there's questions as, as we move forward. But thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, yes. Kevin. Thank, you, Kevin. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So just by way of introduction, and really the board does not need this introduction, but it's kind of, again, um, what we really want to do tonight was set context so that everyone had that same context and that we can talk about priorities and considerations, um, that this has certainly been our ongoing work. If you want to move forward to the next slide, um, we know that we had set these goals back in the original strategic plan that was done during the 2015-2016 school year um, about optimizing and reconfiguring spaces. Um, we specifically then last year, if you want to move ahead, Don, um, we set um, specific goals um, that we would do the addition and renovation at Ames, that we would do the addition of the additional classroom at Blythe Park, um, renovate the district office space to become a multi-purpose room where we're sitting tonight at Central and secure the front office. Um, we also said we'd do the addition of the multi-purpose room at Hollywood and a secured front entrance and include the renovation for small group learning. Um, as we all know, that project, uh, parts of that project were postponed due to the uncertainties related to land and lease ownership, et cetera. And I know the board knows that story well. Um, just to move forward, just a brief recap. Again, um, the work that we're talking about here tonight and the complexity of all it have, have been goals in the direction established by the board with input from the community with ongoing work of the facilities advisory, um, that there have been the community surveys, the demographic study on enrollment, I'm working with the architect, uh, there have been specific focus groups. 
I know Kevin mentioned the one, there was a focus group um, specific to the central houser and getting feedback from parents and students on that also. Um, and then this next slide um, really became that list. And I think you know all of you have alluded to that here in the earlier conversation is that we, we created this list of things that we wanted for each of our schools to have. You know, we wanted every school to have a secured front entrance. We wanted to make sure we were counting for all the existing itinerant small groups, student support areas in the building. We wanted to have the right number of classrooms, including the possibility of a full-day kindergarten, mm -hmm. um, a place to eat lunch and conduct large group projects that we defined as a multi-purpose room. We wanted to leverage our new property acquisitions, alleviate overcrowding across the district um, by making Blythe that multi-section school, which we are kind of gradually, slowly, but surely doing, um, allowing the relocation of early learners from Blythe Park over to Ames, which has now happened, separation of play and parking, um, and then renovating and reconfiguring our library. So um, that, was, that was the list, and I know that was through a lot of board conversation, committee conversation, but, but that was kind of our target list that we, um, we've looked at, and we know that you know, long-range facilities work is really kind of never done. Um, there's always a way to look out on the horizon and figure out what should those next steps be. So I think this continues to be a good list to guide us. Um, but within all that, there's a lot of financial detail to consider, and I'm going to turn it over to Jim, who has done a lot of analysis. I know he and Jeff have had some conversations leading to all this, but our goal tonight is to really provide you with a, that comprehensive, detailed picture so that exactly everything you're talking about is what does this do to fund balance, what, you know, um, ultimately what are the decisions that the board wants to make about possible next steps. And this is the budget for the FY20 capital improvement program. It's, it was estimated by our owner's rep back in November 2019. And the budget for the program was $21.2 million. Um, at that time, then the, the board was considering this and then um, voted to spend the fund balance to pay for this program of, of projects. Uh, as we're wrapping it up, um, our latest estimates show that there will be, uh, that the total cost will be $21 million, which will leave almost uh, $200,000, which we could put towards uh, FY21 projects. So if we start with the $200,000 um, in that, capital improvement program to begin with. The other projects that were planned for in the FY21 program were the Hauser Auditorium, like parking lot, and another 450,000 for projects that we hadn't determined yet. So that means there's almost two million, $2 million already available for the FY21 program. Uh, since, since the approval of the budget in August, We've recognized that the Hauser Central Fire Protection Project will be a priority. Um, it's added here at a million dollars coming out. And um, we reduced the estimates for Hauser Auditorium and Blake Parking Lot um, by $590,000. So that um, the, actually the last two facility goals that remain incomplete from last year, the Hollywood Playground, and multi-purpose room. And if they were to be approved as part of the FY21 program, uh, that would require one and a half million dollars from fund balance. Um, starting drafting the FY22 capital improvement program, revisioning of the Central Hollywood campus that you just reviewed uh, has a ballpark range of three and a half million to eight and a half million. And that would all need to come from fund balance whenever we decide on that project. <coughs> and the annual we, we budget and project a million dollars for maintenance and repair um, to take care of items in the long range plan. So uh, those are listed here for FY22. Uh, looking past next year, the only capital projects remaining from that original DLA long range plan um, is the new furniture uh, that was put in there uh, that was never budgeted or uh, encumbered in the projections. So it was set at $2.6 million, and we've done some of that as we've gone. In FY20, 
um, capital improvement program. Of course, all the expanded areas needed furniture, and, and so that was taken care of at that time. Uh, and just uh, to remind you, we budget a million dollars a year to take care of projects that are in the original long range plan, and of course, we add to that as they come up. So if I take the projections, uh, this is a graph of the year-end fund balance uh, that we put together in February 2020, presented to the board uh, back when we were considering the uh, approval of the FY20 capital improvements program. As you can see, at that time, we were only projecting through FY29, and at that time, we projected a $12.9 million fund balance at the end of FY29, just going under the 40%. Since then, we closed an audit at FY20, and we'll have a presentation from our auditor next meeting. We increased the FY20 ending fund balance by $3 million, so it was as if uh, we had a surplus when the audit was finished. So that moved that whole red line up $3 million in FY20. Can you give us more insight, Jim, into the $3 million? Why, why the $3 million? Sure. Yes. Part of it was we didn't uh, do those maintenance and repair projects that we set a million dollars aside um, while we were doing the you know, $20 billion uh, construction. So there was 750 there that were, were pushed forward um, into the FY21 budget. There was, uh, we, our property tax came in $600,000 above budget. So what nice about that one is that's there then the next 10 years. So that it doesn't drop back down. It's not a one-time thing. It'll accumulate. Um, we saved some money with Lansley and um, we didn't need as much transportation or field trips. And we kept some open positions and spent a little less on overtime than we might then we budgeted. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Um, can you tell me where the central sewer work fits into this equation? If it's ballooning towards three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars, is it in these projections or is it not? In these so it's in the FY twenty CIP. That's going to have two hundred thousand dollars left. Mm -hmm. If they had hadn't. Right, is that $200,000 going to be there after this project is finished in the front? Well, we've, uh, for us, it's estimated this is what we need to do, including that, okay. and we should have $200,000 left. But you said it's ballooning, so I wasn't sure what the final number was going to be. It's going to be four or hundred. We're getting closer and closer. Yeah. That surprises. Okay, so you anticipate the $200,000 will still be there? Yes, okay. that's but remember that original budget had Hollywood yeah. in it, so we spent yeah. it on these projects and that. So that's where that's accounted for. So uh, this is a projection that I put together for this month. It's a draft that I can give you more detailed report at the next meeting. But, um, So we, we move FY20 up three million, and then I assume that property tax would, at, at the higher level, but it would come in slower, and there might be some delays, and there might be some appeals. So um, I really kind of downgraded that where you might expect six million dollars after ten years. Have the FY29 has has gone up um, from 12.9 to. 16.8, so about $4 million higher. So if that's, if we approve the FY20 program and we're at 
knew we would be or thought we would be at 12.9 million out in the future, we added enough to improve on that. So if we transferred that 1.5 million to take care of Hollywood, then that number would drop from 16.8 to 16.3, which is still higher than what we thought a year ago. You mean 15.3? 15.3, not 16, because you're saying a million and a half? Yes. <laughs> I'm just making sure I understand, because we had talked about the flag being close to some larger number, and then, yeah, okay. Um, so the projects that are up for consideration, some higher priorities than others, is um, redoing the fire protection at Central, including some in high Howler, is a million dollars. The new numbers for the Hauser Auditorium, 400,000. And keep in mind that we already have $50,000 from uh, the state for a grant that we'll need to wrap that one up, I think by June 30th to keep the 50,000. Otherwise, we would have to give that back. Uh, the park, parking lot, the latest number is 310,000. And the Hollywood Playground, 350,000. Multi-purpose room, 1.4 million. And then the next year, we have the three and a half million, the eight and a half million um, that we're considering for the campus revisioning. So I took um, those projections. Uh, first, uh, boxes, the projections over the 10 years that we had, as mentioned, the graph a couple slides ago. And then we would end up um, 12.9 million and up 1.29. And now we've updated that, those projections, that we'd end up at 16.83 January, unless we spend some on projects. So that quick next, uh, the Hollywood Playground, and subtracted that money out right off the bat. Um, and then by 21, you can see it drops. And so the first one's a 350,000, and the next one's a 1.4 million. And that we would still be at 44% out in FY29, and just under 40% 10 years from now on those two projects. But when you consider this really large project envisioned here, that's um, really going to affect fund balance. If it's the minimum, we would be at right at 40%. You know, this includes, this is cumulative, so it would include, assume to do in Hollywood, those two projects, then okay. again, take more out of fund balance the next year. And we'd be at 40% in FY 28 and under after that. So that green box, kind of somewhere in that range, we would do the minimum to the maximum. But if we did the maximum, along with these other projects, and we're looking at 20% unbalance um, in FY29. I think it's a 14% under that. So, any questions on the numbers? Do these projections include increases anticipated for staff over the years? So, yeah, they kept, Do you have uh, an assumption for that percentage increase? I used like 3% salary increases. 3%? And, um, actually, I knocked down our property tax increase. Um, normally, we'd use 2%, but we knocked that down. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. 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 And then I used 1.85 going out. But I also, there's another piece of it that gets you what you're allowed to ask for mm -hmm. when we did the levy. Then there's well, how much they tell you you can bill. Mm -hmm. So that's the extension. Then how much really comes in against that. Mm -hmm. So normally we get 98%. And I, Used, I, I followed the curve from 2008 and, and it you know, dropped to 95% in 2008. Mm -hmm. 
and then it worked its way up to this 98 percent. So I followed that curve and used it again now going forward. So I assume we're going to get less than we thought last year at this time. Yeah, I was just asking, you know, because yeah, the house expenses uh, cost usually, and I wanted to make sure we had we knew our assumptions going forward about what those projections would be. Right. So I, I had a question for Ramesh though, in, in regards to that uh, the central house or fire protection project. That one million seems oddly even. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, how do we have? Uh, where's that number coming from? I guess do we have a better idea, or is it? A wide range. Uh, right now, it's only a placeholder because we just released the architect to bring the engineer in. So once they scope out the project by the end of this month, I'll be able to put a more accurate uh, estimate together. So it's just a placeholder at this time. I just can't predict how much it's going to be, especially because of uh, the replacement of the pipes is easy. The sprinkler heads are easy, but the difficult part is going through walls through ceilings, the rebuild that we required, that's a difficult one, which I need to scope out after I see what the engineer comes up with. Mm -hmm. So is a million a, a worst case idea, or at least an attempt at a worst case, or is that a uh, Yes, it's an attempt at the worst case at this time, because typically the sprint, uh, a sprinkler system for building this size should not cost us more than about 300,000 or 350,000. But we would have uh, abatement that needs to be done as well because we have asbestos and lead paint issues that when we replace the pipes and we go through walls that need to be penetrated, we would have to mitigate those areas. So we expect the uh, mitigation costs could be anywhere from 150 to 200,000. Then you need to rebuild all those ceilings that would need to be uh, pulled down. So that's why we feel that that the number is going to be in the close to a million dollars but i believe that includes the design fee as well Ramesh, this is sherry i'm just going to ask a follow-up question on that um would that include rebuilding the new portions of houser i mean uh, yeah houser and central that were just redone no because we uh part the process was we did replace the sprinkler heads in that section but uh, there would be some coordination uh, and tie-ins that we would have to consider in the new design and that will be addressed. But we are not going to be pulling down ceilings in the areas that we just rebuilt. No, not the base. Thanks. Those are new heads and bikes. Okay. Yeah, so Jim, so thanks for, for putting this together. Um, I guess one of my questions is the, uh, the million dollars a year that you're putting in for sort of uh, maintenance and so on, uh, so on and so forth. Um, that also came out of the uh, master facility plan, that estimate, you know, $10 million over the 10 years. I think you're just dividing it by 10, right? Is that right? Right. Roughly, I mean. Um, I guess, given that, that the numbers in that, in that plan have been consistently low, uh, I think we should be cautious about that. Uh, even with like the very first project we did, the Blythe Park roof, they were estimating, I don't know, 700 some thousand, it came in you know, quite a bit higher than that. Um, the central Hauser fire protection is not in there at all for, because they didn't know about it, which is another story. Uh, the Hauser auditorium is not in there at all uh, for reasons that I don't quite understand. So here, there's already you know, a substantial amount of money, like just in the, like the last you know, little bit of time, which is not in that plan anywhere. And it's not part of that $10 million, but they have broken down in, in minutia. So I guess. Two, two, two concerns I have is one is the $10 million. How much confidence do we have in that? Because they've, they've sort of gone through everything, but I wonder, has, are their estimates any good? Because they've been way too low so far. Uh, and I take David's point for the capital projects is different, but for like a, a roof, it's not different. A roof is a roof. Um, and the other thing is that they, 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 they can't anticipate things that are a sort of novel. They, they haven't anticipated everything. I don't know why they didn't anticipate the Hauser Auditorium. They didn't anticipate that the central fire protection is a big project, but you know, just just came on the radar for other reasons. So it seems like there's some risk in here that, you know, this isn't just like we're not done with this. Like there's going to be other stuff like that coming up. And so it seems to me we should somehow think about that. You know, like how do we think about the stuff that we don't know about, or the fact that 
these cost estimates may be too conservative, the too, too not conservative, the opposite of conservative, too, too, too rosy. And when we did the projections last year, we went through FY29, and that took care of the long range plan as we knew it. And now it's able to add another million dollars for FY30. So now we're, the plan is to get that long range plan done by a year later. So it would you know, still be another million dollars every year after that. that so some of these just, they just get pushed off. And hopefully there's no more than a million dollars in projects found every year so we can make some headway. Uh, yeah, I, it would be nice to update that long range plan also. To Jeff's point, I think these estimates are fine for things that we know about, things that have been identified as a need. That's FY 23 through 30. But odds are we're going to have something else pop up. A fire, uh, some mandate from the state. These are good projections, but we can assume realistically that there will be something extra at some point in that next 10 years. And so maybe we don't have to have it in the numbers right now because you can't put in a, well, you could put in a contingency number, but it would be a guess. But I think as we think, think about the numbers moving forward, assume that there's going to be another million dollars missing somewhere along the line in the next 10 years that has to be spent on something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's almost certainly I don't I, know, money as the city. Sorry, sure. I, I think you're absolutely right. I think it's. Why would you think that? Because, <laughs> yeah, cynicism. I know, I know you're joking, but you know it's probably five times that. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Could be possibly. And our, uh, can someone remind me? Our policy says we need a forty percent fund balance. Is that correct? Yeah. Correct. Yes. Correct. Well, I think what Jim raises a very good point, though, which is that to the extent you can stretch things out. Um, you say, let's say if you have a 10 year lifespan and you can make it 11 years, you basically lowered your cost by 10%. Mm -hmm. So things like parking lots, which does not really crucial if it's paved every 10, you know, it could be, so we can stretch that sort of thing out. We save ourselves money. You know, we don't want to do the fire system, but there's stuff that we don't have to be, you know, well, uh, sort of, it doesn't have to be pristine. If the parking lot's not pristine, that's okay. It's not, it's not a priority, you know, so. To the opposite point, if the heating system goes down, that's a problem. That's yeah, an immediate absolutely. expense. So yes. right. that, that's what I'm saying. There's going to be something that will happen. Right. I mean, we had the Hollywood chimney. Right. Didn't identify it in the plan. It was identified and it was an immediate need. And something else will happen. So historically, how much money do we, how much of that million that we plan actually gets spent? Well, this year, this past year, Maybe two fifty, but that was. I mean, there was a lot of other. Yeah, you know, that type of work going on. It was hard to plan a project. Um, I'd have to go back um, before that. I, I'm not sure. Um, if if we kind of stirred in the field that maybe there's going to be a million dollars come up every ten years that we didn't know about. Well, when we found out about this fire protection, we uh, we did go look at the other buildings and so we're learning if you know we're taking that knowledge and, and going with that and, and there isn't work that needs to be done at the others for sprinkler. So I think we're good on sprinkler. Um, <laughs> right? So okay. I was not sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's That's surprises the coming but if I knew what they were there would be surprises. Um, but we're sort of trying to eliminate the possible surprises I guess. But we could put in like one point one million every year and that maybe takes care of if we think that's the possibility. Yeah, just, I, a million contingency of unknowns seems like it, it seems like it would be sufficient, but we have had a lot of things pop up recently, so I'm just be curious over the last 10 years how much of that did we actually get surprised by. It. Um, but then I'm also just wondering too, like inflationary costs and everything, and depending on what you're talking about, is a million, should we do a million, a million one, a million two, a million three, is that, being too conservative, so, or that just historically what does that look so like? It's something to consider, though, that some of the, a lot of these increased expenses that we've had recently were we wouldn't have had them, or we wouldn't have known we needed to have them if we hadn't done these huge projects, both here at Central and at Ames. Yeah. Without comparable projects, you know, on town, 
that's something to consider of how much of this, you know, would do we want to set aside for contingency. Right, and I, I guess I, I, I'm concerned about putting just sort of an arbitrary number of a million, sort of saying, assuming um, that unless we have something to go on. I mean, I do think we well, should. Well, that, that's my point, right. is if we've only spent 250, why do we keep doing a million? Because 750 plus 750. Well, the, uh, plus 750. sort of the, the uh, long range delay plan uh, breaks down the sort of 10-year cost into two pieces. One is capital, and that was like, uh, I don't know, supposed to be 17 million, and the other was $10 million for General maintenance. Operation. But that wasn't just like we made it up. Mm -hmm. They went down and we said to replace this door handle and this window and this, it's like in minute, it's minute detail. Right, right. So it's not like it's made up. My, 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 my problem is that one is I think they probably underestimate, based on experience, they underestimated things like the blight through again was 700,000, it was actually like 1.1 million or something like that. I'm a little bit skeptical of the other numbers going forward. I think we should, we should have inflation, we should adjust for least inflation because that could add up over time. But I am concerned that they probably have low ball or those numbers. I'm not sure I trust those numbers for they, they put in for the cost. And the other thing is what we're talking about, stuff comes up. Now you're right, maybe we won't come find as much, but who knows, you know, you never know. So mm -hmm. so I, I think this, these are not just like, the, the one million year is not pie in the sky, it's actually what we should be doing on a maintenance schedule, at least according to them. Yeah, so. but it seems like the information we have is completely inaccurate. So I'm just wondering, do we need to go, I mean, what you, you said it was like three or four years ago, but like, do we need to- Ooh, Completely inaccurate, like, I don't no. think that's sort of like, I don't think it's like inaccurate, I'm like, it could be a, a biased on the downside because I don't think they did that, I think it's, it's it's likely it's, it is tied to the downside. I don't think it's like um, all the stuff they identify. I think they probably we probably do need to do like the roofs and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I think that's like I don't I think it's completely inaccurate because I think it's or possibly inaccurate because their cost estimates are I don't know how reliable their cost estimates are. Oh, yeah. Cool. Well, and they missed the chimney, yeah. and I'm just wondering like if they didn't look at the fire pumps on the sprinkler system, that seems to me like a very basic thing. That's so basic. Are yeah. boilers and under? So, Okay. Boilers and roofs, I mean, that's the part I remember them saying, like, you have to plan for boilers and roofs. Like, those are big ticket items yeah. that will, you know, do have a life cycle, lifespan. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's what I recall, and I didn't realize I'd have to go back in and dig into some it's... of the detail. I mean, the other thing I know, I think Ramesh is still on the call. Ramesh, we've talked about redoing this now, now that our facilities are more known, right? Or, you know, is it, and I, Ramesh, I don't know if it's you or if you had said there are other people that, that do this work. And that is Okay. That's correct. Um, you should have a facilities uh, assessment done at least once every five years and an update following that. And because, as you know, there's a lot of finite life cycle um, to equipment. And we, would have, we should be able to identify key elements and project the remaining lifespan of those elements. So in defense of the million dollars that is set up for the for maintenance, projects like roof replacement should be part of a capital plan. They should not be part of a maintenance. So we, we can predict, for example, a roof needs to be replaced every, say, 20 years or 25 years. Therefore, it should be budgeted for that period, and therefore, it comes in as a capital project. The smaller elements, as what Jeff mentioned, replacement of windows, door knobs, the smaller ticket items, that should be drawn from the maintenance plan as the way it's shown. But the most important thing is to get a facilities assessment done correctly and the capital budget should come out of that. That's what drives a capital program. Yeah, and it just, I mean, being the newest member here, not having a lot of the background and all that kind of stuff, I'm just wondering, like, do we need to kind of reassess the assessment? instead of just continuing forward. Uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, it yeah. makes sense Sounds to me, like but I, schedule I, for it, yeah. I would totally be yeah. opposed to yeah. having an uh, architectural firm do it, because like, the firm before DLA did the life safety, completely missed the sprinkling thing. That's like, that that, that system wasn't, wasn't like marginal, it just like looked at it, it was not gonna work, right? period. They missed that entirely, and in the oldest building, the one that's probably the most fire prone, uh, and so that's like, that's a loss that you can't like, <laughs> it's like, and then DLA's numbers are, are again, you know, I think suspect. Uh, so I, I would say if Ramesh knows a good firm that does yeah. that in the next couple of years, I would definitely think that should be done. Yeah, I'd rather not have someone who's going to get a consent and the work to be done or something is done. I, I don't like that. It's a conflict and only encourages them to raise the price, which seems to happen with every project we have. They need to pull into some crazy numbers. And I'd rather have a separate firm 
it, I mean, honestly, Ramesh is giving us that av advice, which is redo, update the, the assessment plan, and it should be, Sherry's right, it should be done by an independent firm who has no stake in the future expenses or, sorry, spend, or a percentage of that work. The only downside of that is that firm would have no um, background of our building, so you're site. paying for a lot of but that. But they can take that 300-page report that DLA did <laughs> and revisit, and this is, Ramesh can confirm or deny this, but you look at the high cost items first. Those are the ones that are the real risks. Doorknob's a doorknob. Sorry, DLA's, I can't hear you very well, I'm sorry. Sorry, I wasn't facing the microphone, but basically the assessment should really focus in on those high value items. A doorknob is a doorknob. If it needs to be replaced, fine, but it, you know, if the boiler goes, if the roof goes, if the exterior masonry needs work, those are the things where we really want to know now because that's a capital expense. Oh, yes. Um, uh, a life cycle assessment and a building assessment, there are five major categories uh, that are established when we do these kind of assessments, which includes maintenance, replacement, code violations, ADA, and upgrade. So there are five categories that are identified for each of the buildings, and those numbers are developed, and then you assign a timeline for the replacement or the upgrade, say whether it's a immediate, whether it's a one to three year plan, a five year plan, or the 10 year plan. So that way you know how much money you need to save or have in the bank to do a given project. And this includes a lot of contingency built into these numbers. It includes an escalation factor and as I said, it's very easy. An assessment can miss items. I'm not saying they're perfect. But the fact that you're going to review that every couple of years makes a huge difference. So that way you can update that uh, assessment on a, say, three-year basis. It'll pick up if something was missed. It'll adjust it. And that way your capital plan is always uh, fluid and relevant. Now, when we do this, Ramesh, is this hired out as professional services? Yes, there are firms that do this. Um, typically, uh, the way I've seen it being done is it's not done by the same architect who you work with because they may have a different re you know, a vision of the buildings. There are firms that just do this, and there are really competent uh, entities that produce these reports with life cycle costs and the whole process. They're not very expensive, they're reasonably priced, but the important thing out here is they don't have a vested interest in going to the next stage, which is the design or, or the construction. They, that's all they do. All right, so it sounds like we're all in agreement that that needs to happen. Yeah, I, I should note here, so. we're at 827. We do have a couple of uh, additional items on the agenda. Yeah, policy. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> well so yeah, can I, I suggest that Ramesh gives us a recommendation of three firms yes. and then the facilities or finance, whoever wants to do it, can pick and then move forward with uh, an assessment or life cycle analysis. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Sure can. Um, and perhaps this is a discussion for another time. That there, there definitely are some big financial concerns or considerations to con Concerns to consider it uh, in regards to some of these projects we've been shown tonight, some of the larger projects, and how that would affect us in terms of our 40% balance uh, you know, goal. Uh, so I, I'm saying, I'm thinking that's probably a discussion for another time. Yeah, probably. Because yeah. I kind of agree with Jeff, and I think somebody else might have said it too. I'm sort of a just do it all at once, get it done, don't go through multiple phases of construction, but it's a lot of money yeah, so with right. all these other unknowns that's really hard to say let's just jump in and then yeah, yeah and I, I do think with feedback that was given tonight I do think we can go back to the facilities committee and kind of adjust and I mean I think we can do a project for under eight and a half million that's great that's not all the bells and whistles you know but I think 
I think we can come up with a modification that's a, uh, somewhere else in that price range, which would then make it seem like a project we could complete all at once. I mean, that's yeah. how I'm feeling, but. Yeah. I mean, with our existing fund balance the number being 15 or 16, so it'd be like half. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think there is some question there of like like this this really I what I do not understand is <laughs> this price jump between two and a half and eight and a half. Like I don't understand. But it doesn't look yeah. like you're you're adding much to, to be honest between that basic plan, the first phase and the last phase. It doesn't seem like triple the price to me. Well, like, and, and, and perhaps yeah. we'll, we'll hear and that. Yeah. that yeah. 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 So I think yeah. there's a lot that we yeah, go back to yeah. committee yeah. And, and drill down yeah. on. So I really appreciate all the feedback. I, it, to me, I feel like a, there was a lot of things I heard said tonight that I, I didn't want to either consider or just didn't think anybody would say. So it was very helpful and inviting discussion for me. All right. I, that's what I would say. That's what we want to do is really set context and invite the conversation. So thank you. I think it's in, informed all of us around you know, next considerations, not necessarily next formal steps, yeah. other than the Hollywood multi-purpose room and the Hollywood playground will come back. We are moving forward, as you know, with those MOUs, so we will end up with more detail about both of those projects. All right. Thanks for putting this together, Jim. It was very helpful. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Joel and <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Is that uh, are we? Does the uh, planning committee rest? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we want policy, Dan. <laughs> All right. It's time for the disco ball to descend. Uh, the, the part we've all been waiting for, Mr. Barsati, with the policy committee. So, um, thank you, Dan. Um, I will try to make this as brief as possible. Uh, so, uh, there are additional policies. This is going to be the first, the first reading, correct? Right. Yeah. Yes. So I'll go through and read the policies and then uh, give a brief overview. Right. So um, the first policy is policy uh, from Plus Memo 106, policy 3 colon 40, superintendent, policy 4 colon 80, accounting and audits, policy 4 colon 90, student activity and fiduciary funds. Policy 6, colon 20, school year, calendar, and day. Policy 6, colon 340, student testing and assessment program. Policy 7, colon 100, health, eye, and dental examinations, immunizations, and exclusions of students. Policy 7, colon 140, search and seizure. Policy 7, colon 300, co-curriculars, athletics and then the five-year review is policy 5 colon 270 employment at will compensation and assignment policy 6 colon 315 high school credit for students in grades 7 or 8. so uh, i don't know how but most if you, how much you've looked at this but most of the policies are footnote changes um, there are not many changes. The only one that I'd probably say is significant and it's really not that significant is the um, policy 4 colon 90, that's student activity and fiduciary funds. It used to be um, activity uh, funds and so they just separated it out and put in a special section for fiduciary funds. Um, most of the policies also, many of the policies I should say, also deal with especially like regarding the examinations and testing and assessments. Um, that deals with a lot of the taking into consideration the COVID-19 and the pandemic in that. So I don't know if anyone has any questions or. I, I did pique my interest just slightly uh, in regards to the fiduciary funds. How different is that from what currently exists? Sure. Um, and there's a separate section just for fiduciary funds. Mm -hmm. So they did, didn't really change anything except add a separate section for fiduciary funds. In there. Mm -hmm. That was pretty much different. I guess what one was describing seemed to me like that's basically what's in place already, correct? Or is that Co something? Correct. Well, I'm going to have to pull that one up here. Actually, I can pull it up here. Um, I think the 
if I may, sure. the, the issue is that fiduciary funds are slightly different mm -hmm. than student activity funds, mm -hmm. and they have different sources of where the money comes from. Right. Right. Okay. It's just more of a labeling, so you don't have transfer between the funds or borrowing or loans between them, I assume. Oh, I see. I understand that. It's explained a little bit in the notes. If you guys come up with a good chance to take a look at it a little bit more and have any questions, please that please reach out and I'll be one happy to. Okay. All right. Thanks. That was. That was faster than I thought. Poor policy always gets stuck. Poor policy, and it's so important. I don't want to discuss it. I don't take it personally. It's okay. It's okay. Oh yes, most definitely. Oh well, that was very fast. So I don't know, Sherry, did you have enough time for uh, the other notes for education, or are you get another few minutes? Well, we don't have much reports. Our first, our second day back, or third, sorry, third day back um, for hybrid. So um, things are rolling, and I don't have any reports even that recently. But um, I guess I just encourage everyone to return their participation slips for the saliva testing if they're still interested in doing so. Because it's a first week back. So. Seems like it was a smooth, I don't know how Martha talked to the principals, it seems like it was a smooth. Uh, might, might be important to talk to the mic right. or wear the mic, I mean, just was, to make sure uh, it gets to the recording. It was a good time for people to come back. I think they transitioned okay from the yeah. yeah. I mean, I walked through a couple of buildings today and I was there on Monday morning and it, it felt good to see kids back and the yeah. staff back and uh, it seemed like we just kind of jumped right back into um, not business as usual but into our hybrid program the way it had been you know prior to the adaptive pause. Yeah. And that's all. All right, thanks Sherry. Uh, the personnel committee. Nothing at this time. Okay. Uh, and then the finance committee. No, uh, nothing right now. Okay, uh, then that takes us to old business. Uh, the 2020-2021 goals. This is an action item. Uh, at this time, is there a motion that the board approve the 2020-2021 district goals as presented? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Only, I only had a slight um, nuance and I'm hoping that the um, strategic planning committee will really understand that we did have some gaps last spring in mathematics um, and that they understand that specific areas of focus really did mean a decline in some areas and we're not, we're not the only ones, this is not an uncommon situation from last spring, um, but I did hopefully that maybe our board members can help them understand what Angela or um, curriculum person had talked to us about and just trying to really identify what we could do. Definitely, it's, it's really hard to tell during remote learning, but I really hope they understand that nuance. So that was my only question about the wording, so I'm glad it's in there. So. You know, these, we've, been talk, we've talked about these for a little while, so mm -hmm. I think this was to bring them to action yeah, after the discussion yeah. we had. Yeah, I'm just hoping it is. Okay. I'm going to guess that the uh, staff will bring that up. Yeah. As well. <laughs> I don't think it's I don't think it's lost on them. Yeah. I mean, as far as the data. Yeah. yeah. All right. Sure. All right. Uh, any further discussion? Are we ready to vote? Yes, sir. <laughs> Linda's more than ready. Kathy, are you still here? I am. Okay. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Uh, Kathy, can you call the roll? Can I just uh, ask, I did not hear who made the motion and seconded it. Oh. Uh, I think Joel made the motion. I'll give it to Dave. Okay. Yeah, I seconded it. You can put Dave down for a second. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. All right, ready. Uh, Mr. Muirhead. Uh, hi. Mr. Miller. Hi. Mr. Barsati. Hi. Mrs. Murphy. Hi. Mr. Marhol? Aye. Mrs. Kleiber? Aye. And Mr. Hunt? Aye. Motion passes. 
Okay, uh, there is nothing under new business at this point. Uh, is there any uh, additional public comment? Did anything come in on our email? So I think everyone realizes we've set up a D96 public comment during the pandemic. Um, people could also, in theory, come in person. We just have to limit them, you know, come in, not stay. If I had to guess, they're watching the news. <laughs> I think you're right, Sarah. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> was there something going on today? Yeah, just looking. <laughs> <laughs> just something. Just something. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's no, no comments. Okay, thanks. All right. Uh, then at this time, uh, future meeting dates, uh, January 20th is the regular business meeting at 7 p.m. in the multipurpose room at Ames. Board will enter into closed session at 6.30 p.m. if necessary. Return to open session at 7. Uh, February 3rd, 2020 is committee of the whole meeting, 7 p.m. at Hollywood School. February 17, 2021, regular business meeting, 7 p.m. in the multi-purpose room at Ames. Board will enter into closed session at 6.30 p.m. if necessary and return to open session at 7. And if there is nothing else, this meeting is adjourned.